And I've divided this into many parts because the world of stock market indices is very big. And I specifically wanted to start with one that you are likely to see on TV and on the front pages of newspapers quite often, and that is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So for today's session, we'll just focus on the Dow, and in later sessions, we'll talk about the S&P 500 and the FTSE and the Hang Seng and other indices that you might hear. So first of all, a brief disclaimer. This presentation is for educational purposes only. It is not advice, investment, tax, legal, or any other form of advice, and just watching this does not form an advisor-client relationship. And please note that investment involves risk, including the risk that you may lose some or all of your money. Now, if you watch financial news, if you watch TV, if you ever turn on Bloomberg or CNBC, chances are you've seen a screen like this, uh, or even on the radio, you've heard measures like uh, the Dow is down 282 points. And uh, this screenshot from Bloomberg TV is probably one of the more familiar ones, where you will see the Dow in this case was down 282 points on the day, down about 1.04%. And it showed two other major US stock market indices, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. But for today, we're just gonna focus on the Dow Jones Industrial Average because it is the oldest and the simplest. And once you understand the Dow, it becomes a little bit easier to understand the other components as well. Um, as mentioned, you'll also see these on the front pages of newspapers. This is an old uh, clipping, an old front page from the Wall Street Journal on September 16th, 2008. That was the day after Lehman Brothers collapsed and the market got sent into a panic. And you may notice on the top line here, you see the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the NASDAQ, the Nikkei, and several other indices. Now on that particular day, the Dow was down 500 points, which at that time was down 4.4%. And that's meant to give you an initial reaction of how these different markets have reacted to the news. Uh, so you see on the left how stock markets have reacted. In the middle, you see under the 10-year treasury how the bond market has reacted. You see oil and gold prices. And we'll go each of those in turn. But today, let's talk about the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And what does it mean when you see the Dow is down 1%, 4%, or up 1%? So in a nutshell, a stock market index is basically just an average of stock prices. It's just a measure of whether stock prices on average have gone up or down. And that type of index specifically is called a price index. And there are different types of indices we'll talk about later, but the Dow Jones Industrial Average is just an average of stock prices. That's it. Uh, in other words, if you own a, a, a $10,000 diversified portfolio of stocks similar to the index, and the index goes up or down by 1% in one day, then your portfolio should go up or down by 1% that day as well. Uh, that said, in the earlier picture, where we saw if the day before you had $10,000 in a diversified US stock portfolio, and then the Dow was down 1%, you would probably expect your portfolio to be down 1% uh, or down by about $100 over that one day period. And that's just counting price movements. It's not counting dividends. It's not counting any other way that you as an investor can make a return on your investment. It's just a quick shortcut way to say, in general, is the market up or down? Now, one nice thing about the Dow is that if you own an equal number of shares of each of the 30 companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, that is, it makes it the easiest index to track exactly. The S&P 500, by contrast, has 500 companies, and it is not measured by an equal number of shares. So it makes it a little bit harder to track. We'll talk about that in the next session, but basically if you own one share of each of these 30 companies, which we're gonna talk about later, you will track that Dow Jones Industrial Average going up and going down. Now there are differences in how different indices are composed, calculated, and so forth. For example, I mentioned price return for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and there are also total return indices, which we will talk about later. Now, a brief history of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It was started back in 1896, so over 100 years ago uh, by two partners, da Charles Dow and Edward Jones. Now, these were not fund managers, and they were not really set off to, write, to set a benchmark for the fund management industry. Rather, they were journalists. They had started a newspaper called the Wall Street Journal, and the reason that they created this average was that they wanted a more concise way to say, on average, have stock prices gone up or down? Because on any given day, there are lots of stocks in the market. Some go up, some go down. In general, can we measure whether stock prices are, are, are rising or falling? 
And at that time, they'd actually created two indices. One was called the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and the other was the Dow Jones Transportation Average, which mostly contained railroads at the time. Now it contains mostly uh, airlines and other forms of transportation. But again, the idea was to create a simple average for journalists to have a way of just following and reporting on whether the market as a whole was going up or down. At the time, it started with only 12 uh, companies. Later in the 1910s, it was expanded to 30, which it has remained to this day. And of the original 12, General Electric was the longest lasting and was only removed in, in 2018. So now the 30 companies I'm gonna show you, none of them were in the original uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. You will see here on this bullet pointed list what happened to the other uh, 11 companies such as American Cotton Oil, American Sugar, and so forth like that. Many of those are companies you've probably never heard of. And the story of what's happened to them is quite a bit of uh, fascinating financial history to read as well. Now, this is what the Dow Jones Industrial Average looks like today. It is made up of 30 companies, and chances are you, you have heard of most of these companies, if not all of them. Apple, United Healthcare, Home Depot, Microsoft, and so forth. Um, they uh, represent several different sectors uh, across the American, com American economy, but what is important to note is that these are all American companies. They're all US-based companies. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is very much a US index. And although originally it was meant to represent industrials, here you will see it represents several different sectors, including financials and healthcare and information technology. Uh, the one sector that, that the Dow Jones Industrial Average still excludes though, is transportation. So for example, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has never included an airline. Those were always in the Dow transports. So those are just things to understand when you understand what is in the Dow Jones Industrial Average and what is not. You will also notice in the fourth column here that I have sorted this list of stocks by share price, by price per share. Now, as we learned in our unit on how to understand stocks and, and how to evaluate whether a stock is a good investment or not, just looking at whether the share price is 300 or 30 is actually quite irrelevant. Uh, a stock could be split or it could reverse split. The price per share by itself is irrelevant. But in measuring the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is meant to be a simple average of share prices. That means it includes an equal number of shares of each company. What makes that important here is that Apple at $300 a share has almost 10 times the weight of a company like Pfizer, which trades at only around $30 a share. And that has nothing to do with the relative sizes of the companies, the relative profitability of the companies, the relative dividends or any other financial prospects, but only about the price per share. And you'll notice one extreme example that's often shown is Goldman Sachs, which is down here on the list with a $176 share price, but only a $61, million, uh, $61 billion market cap actually has about four times the weight of say a Cisco Systems or a Pfizer, which are much, much larger companies. So that is one of the biggest difference between, differences between the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the S&P 500, and why some people say the Dow is a bit of an outdated index or why it's more or less irrelevant. That said, I'm gonna show you on a later slide why that price weighting really isn't as big a deal as some people make it out to be. Because again, it has the simple advantage that you simply own an equal number of shares of each one. You buy one share of each, and you're now able to perfectly track the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. Notice that equal number of shares is different than putting an equal dollar amount in, in each one of these. That would be called an equally weighted index rather than a price weighted index. But that in a nutshell is how you would construct your own Dow if you had a brokerage account with no commissions and you could simply buy one share of each. Now in the next column I show the dividend yield. One thing about that, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which makes it different than say the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, is that at least so far, just about every company in the Dow Jones Industrial Average has some sort of dividend history, has paid a dividend, and that is some measure of what the expected return of the company is. Um, those dividends on average for most of these companies have grown. You'll notice Raytheon Technologies, which actually just had a recent uh, split off from uh, Raytheon and United Technologies earlier, um, shows negative dividend growth here, but you have to watch that for corporate actions. You'll also notice that dividend growth is not the same as earnings and is not the same as share price total return. You'll notice in the second to last column, I show what the past five years average rate of return was on each of the companies in the Dow compared with the actual growth in earnings. And you'll notice some cases where you would have made money in the stock, even though the company's earnings didn't grow, or where the earnings grow and you wouldn't have made quite as much, much money in the stock. 
that could very much be titled why investing is hard because even though you could be right about the business it can take many many years for the stock price and the total return of your dividends and price appreciation to catch up with that in the last column here i also want to show that uh, these stocks in the Dow Jones Industrial Average trade right now on two different exchanges. Until 1999, every single stock in the Dow Jones Industrial Average only traded on the New York Stock Exchange. But since 1999, when Microsoft and Cisco were added, uh, stocks that traded on the NASDAQ national market started to be included in the Dow as well. But still, this index only includes uh, shares that trade on these two US exchanges. So no OTC shares, no shares traded in London or on any other exchange as we discussed elsewhere. So um, as I mentioned earlier, there is the concern about Goldman having more than four times the weight of a Pfizer just because of the price per share. And does that make the index poorly constructed or very, very lopsided? In this chart, I really what I'm showing you here is I'm showing you three different uh, mutual funds or exchange traded funds, three top funds. The one in blue is the one that tracks the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The one in orange is the one that tracks the S&P 500. And the one in red is the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index. So it has that the last one in red tracks over 5,000 US companies on a cap weighted basis. And what should impress you about this chart starting in 1998 when that ETF tracking the Dow Jones Industrial Average was launched is that since then the actual results, the actual returns you would have gotten from any of these three really haven't been that different. $10,000 that you would have invested in any of these three funds back in 1998 would have turned into a little more than $40,000 uh, as of the end of as of April 2020. So even though we can go into a lot of detail and debate about index construction, the fact is when you're tracking US stocks, whether you're using 30 or 500 or 5,000, historically it has not made that much of a difference. In this next chart here, we're going back a little bit further, going all the way back to 1961. Now here I wasn't able to include the uh, effective dividends. The D Dow Jones Industrial Average is usually paid a higher dividend yield, so the returns of these two indices would actually be even closer. But really what should amaze you again is you're talking about 30 stocks versus 300 stocks and overall how closely uh, do these two track each other uh, even over a 60 year period of time. So going back to the list of 30 companies, depending on why you're choosing the companies that you invest in or don't invest in, the advantage of limiting your investment universe down to 30 companies or having a narrower index is that it's much easier to look on one page and get a glance of what are the types of features you want or don't want in the 30 companies in your portfolio. Even though this is only 30 companies, this slide already is pretty crowded. And I'm best at guessing, for those of you who are not familiar with all of these already, it will take you time to go down and read every single one of these names and every single one of these indicators. But what I'm showing on this slide is some data on how many full-time employees each of these 30 companies has. And then also how MSCI, so another major index provider that competes with Dow Jones indices, has ranked each one of the Dow 30 companies on environmental, social, and governance metrics. So these uh, ESG are factors that you're gonna hear a lot about in the frame of socially responsible investing, uh, green investing, and so forth like that. And ESG is simply a framework for breaking down how companies score on environmental, social, and governance factors. These uh, measures of leader, average, or laggard are simply what you can find on the MSCI website. If you look up any company, go to the MSCI website and see how they have scored them on ESG. If you look at other ESG uh, metrics or other ESG research services, you'll find different metrics as well. But the point is with 30 companies, it is much easier for you to do this kind of analysis than it would be with 500 or 5,000 companies. So, Thank you for uh, attending this session on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Next time, we're going to be talking about the S&P 500 and FTSE Russell indices. So that will cover much of the rest of the indexing of the US stock market. And then in the session after that, we're going to be doing a session that goes around the world of the many different stock market benchmarks uh, you will see from Europe to Asia to emerging markets. That will be the names like the FTSE and the Nikkei and the DAX and the Hang Seng and then the MSCI world. Uh, we're going to survey all of that in the session after next. So thanks again for joining. And here's my contact information again, in case you want to follow us on our GFM Money Minute channel, visit our website. You can also follow me on Seeking Alpha or on Twitter or send me an email or uh, WeChat message. I look forward to hearing from you and happy investing.